Right, so this is the final chapter in the Marauding Bass podcast. Podcast number eight, I think this one is. And we're going to base this one on lures. So um, so this one's going to be quite interesting. So I do, this is my favourite uh, method. However, you know, it is nice to catch a good one on a, on a peeler crab or a bit of lugworm or a whole squid or a mackerel head. That's fine. But lures is, um, the reason why I like lure fishing is because I suppose I've done quite a lot of it overseas, really. Done a hell of a lot of it, a hell of a lot of fishing for um, Chinook salmon on the South Island of New Zealand um, with just like metal spinners. And I spent hours and hours. I was over there working on some earthquake thing, project, and I was over there for a few years. And you spend hours and hours and hours just chucking these metal spinners. So you just get used to sort of like that. But it's exactly the same principle for bass fishing in the UK or Europe or anywhere like that. It's the same thing. You don't use plugs over there, but you use like metal spinners. But bass like metals as well. They really do. Um, if you can, if you spend the time on a tide fishing for them when they're there, you'd be surprised. They'll, 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 they'll take a little Abu 20 gram Tyser all, all day long. Um, so really with the, um, the lure fishing, all I would say is you need, it's the same principles of tide, um, the same principles apply time of the tide. There'll be a small window to catch them at the bottom of the tide and there'll be a window on the incoming tide maybe the top half of the incoming tide, where it would be good to use that technique. So you don't want to exhaust yourself lure fishing. That's easy to flog yourself to death. Um, if the water's mucky where you are on your lure fishing, I'd say you've got to judge it just right. I would say if you're wearing a Wellington boot and you can see your toe, if it's a bit cloudy, but you can just about see your toe on a Wellington boot, I'd say that's fishable, if that's anything you know to go by. So... You don't want to waste your time when it's chocolatey too much. Um, so you've got to, you've got to gauge the sense. Sometimes in those sort of conditions when it's a bit murky, you might find that's a bit clearer further out. So you can fish. Um, if you can find a look to whack a long way, you might 50 yards of the return is where it's relatively clear. So you're going to be all right. If you're fishing murkyish water, you want something um, like it's white, sort of colour, savage gear, do some really nice metals. It's like a 30 gram one, they do a white one. Um, some different like luminous colours, they're really good. They've got a lovely sort of fluttering action and you can pause your retrieve and it'll flutter back down to the surface. And they, they, they like to sort of take it on the drop. So that's an option. Changing the tide can affect the colour of the sea as well. So one minute it'll be clear and then all of a sudden the tide will change go the other way and it sort of churns it up and then you're like, oh shit, I'll go back in the car and that's over, so to speak. So all different things can can, can, can do it. Um, with your lure fishing, you really want to be there when um, there's a bit of surf running, but it's still sort of clearish. Do you know what I'm saying? You still know it's clear, but there's been a bit of a change in the wind and there's a bit of, a bit of a slight onshore wind. You've just got maybe a foot or two foot of white water coming in as well. They seem to like that. Um, so that's that's important. Um, so with the lures, so you can fish on the surface. Um, my recommendation would be fish braid on the surface because with the dish of the lure, you seem to get more of a sort of a um, a darty action where it spits the water, depending on what sort of lure you're lo- uh, use, using. So um, that's always good. Um, good thing about fish on the surface, you generally lose less gear because it's high on the surface. Um, and your hooks can stay sharp as well. Remember when you wind in your lure, don't know if you've checked out some of my other videos, but when you wind in the lure, whether it's a metal um, with trebles on or a popper or a plug, you notice so just as it gets comes in, I don't let the lure drag up the sand or the stones. I literally just, with a nine-foot rod I use, I just lift it out before then, protecting the, um, the barbs of the hook because they can get blunt ever so quickly. I noticed in New Zealand... When you fish like 50 gram, big 50, 60, 70 gram metals for salmon, fishing sandy beaches near river mouths, we used to wind it in, and with the big swells and stuff, you sort of wind it in, and it and it and it, it comes up against the gravel, 
and after about 10 or 15 casts, you've just put your finger on the treble, and that's, that's, that's nearly blunt. Some guys used to just use a, a sharpening stone, but what I used to do, I used to take off the hook, take off the treble, put it in my pocket, pull out a packet of new trebles, and just clip on a new treble so it was razor sharp. Especially for salmon, which have a really bony mouth. You've got to have sharp hooks. It's a bit like the bass. So they've got quite hard, hard mouths, mouths as well. I like my treble hook to be absolutely razor sharp. Another tip with regards to hooks you use, you can fish a single hook. Now, a single hook comes in very handy when you're fishing over shallow, snaggy ground with the lures on a plug or a metal. Not so much, it doesn't matter with a popper because he's up high and out of the way. Um, but mind those rocks. But if you're fishing a metal, or, and you like fishing a metal, or you might like fishing fishing a, a plug, there's nothing wrong with changing over to maybe just uh, right at the very end of the lure, changing it over to a single hook, maybe a 2-0, a 3-0. Not too big, but razor sharp. So what that is, what that means is, if there's kelp or weed there, and you get caught up in it, you've got a good chance of, 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 of banging it out. And if you do get hooked up, don't get too sort of like, you know, just pulling it out and just take your time with it. Lots of, li especially with braid, lots of little little jerks like this. And you'll be surprised if you do that for maybe a couple of minutes, all of a sudden that will just give and try different angles up and down the beach. Don't give up on it and just snap it off. Just st stay with it. And then you can wind it back, got your favourite lure and away you go. But if you're retrieving metals over mixed ground, shallow mixed ground, angled your rod up high, You'll see it on some of them other videos, angle your rod up high, and then sort of a, not, not a, not a, um, um, a slow retrieve, because a slow retrieve is mixed in with like catching on the bottom, so maybe a medium to fast. They should still take it. It's almost like you're fishing um, higher up in the water. So if it's all clear and all, all these things, and it's looking like you're going to snag your gear, you, you, and it's clear enough, you might as well put on a good um, um, a Yozuri mag popper, um, put on a, a Halco rooster popper. One night I had a, um, I had a really good session with a Halco 105 rooster popper. They don't look much, um, but they do jet the water really well. I had about five or six bass smash it in about 15 minutes as the sun was going down. Flat calm. It was almost like the bass had turned up on that spot as a pod and they were just there. And um, just for 10 minutes, they were just crashing into anything and um, but before the a few hours before that nothing not at all it's almost like they've been i was fishing over a, a mile crop um you want to that's another thing about this lure fishing you want to look for a feature you need to be fishing over something like if you're looking at the ocean and where, where you're fishing something like a dark weed patch or um i generally don't fish off the rocks deeper water but there's some other guys down in cornwall and devon where they will you know, they'll fish deeper areas and let the lure sink deep to catch them, but I don't know much about that. I mean, I'd love to give it a go, but I don't live in that neck of the woods. So I'm talking about shallow, sort of mixed ground sort of beaches. And, um, yeah, it's um, just, you know, pick your, um, pick your times to go. Um, you know, on some of the other videos, I've discussed sort of tides and what I would say is a good time. Bass seem to look a lot of tide. And they do say if you're fishing for baits with baits over rough mixed ground, they say the neat tides are quite good. But I've probably not done too much of that. I generally go on what I call bass tides. If I was boat fishing for bass, I would um, those tides coincide with them always being quite sp spring tides, quite sort of you know whenever we've done it off Guernsey or. You know, other places where we've gone, like Weymouth, to do it off the boat and stuff like that, Brighton. We've always gone on what, what the skipper calls sort of... And I've, I've I've used that into the shore fishing, and that works best for me. Um, so, yes, yeah, so you've got your plugs. Um, obviously, you know, read the packet on the plugs, how deep they dive. Um, but usually the plugs have, like, you know, two or three trebles on them. Do you really need all them trebles on there? You can probably take the middle one off or take the, take the front one off. And stuff like that. I generally fish metal lures over plugs. I've got a few. Um, I brought one just recently. I had a little go with it the other day. It was called a Zonk. Quite expensive. I just fancied it just to have a, have a little go with it. Um, but it looked like it had all... Where I fish it, it looked like it was going to snag up all day long. So I had a few casts with it. And I thought, oh, no, I'll, I'll fish a, um, a high water. I 
fish high the water with it because I don't I don't want to lose it. Twenty five quid, you don't want to lose it straight away. So I generally sort of um, fish with metals if I'm going to go subsurface and lower down. And you've got a chance of something else like that. You'll be you'll be surprised a metal, a small metal. You could pick up a cool fish, a pollock, a cod could grab it. Flatfish. I've even had flounder come up and smash it on certain stretches of the coast at certain times of the year in the summertime. So with a with a with a with a metal spoon, you're 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 you're, you're fishing for lots of different things. Probably going to get a bass who's going to whack it, but um, you get a mackerel on it too. A mackerel mackerel love a metal. So do you know what I'm saying? Another tip with regards to um, lure fishing, you can fish a, like a teaser above it. You can fish, get hold of a um, a small trout fly with a strong hook, but not too much sort of feathering and stuff like that on it. A little eyes and things like that. You can get some real fancy ones. Now I've sometimes attached them ahead of the metal lure, and um, I've had I've had bass grab hold of it. And um, I've, had, I've had them like that. I've had them like that. You can use a little red gill to do it as well. A trout fly, sea, a sea run trout sort of fly or salmon fly or something like that. A head of like a 20 gram metal or something like that. I, even like a sabiki, you can even use, um, you can get snip, snip, have a sabiki rig, snip, snip off a few of the snoods and just tie them on. And um, the mackerel usually come in at high water so you can not only get them on your metal, but you can get them on it or, or literally attach your metal to your five hooks of small sabiki rig. I'm talking about mini sabikis. And the bass, bass will grab that as well. Bass will grab the main sort of lure. Um, but you can pick off a food mackerel live baits as well. So as long as you've got a little, um, one of the min miniature paddling pills on the beach where you're fishing and a, and a rod already rigged up for a live bait, you can just free line a, a mackerel just... 10 yards off the beach, just in the surf there, let him just swim about out there, just leave him alone, leave the ratchet on, and then just carry on spin fishing. So there's lots of options. You can still sort of, I, gen I generally don't like to fish, that's the only way you can do it with live baits, but I generally, if I'm going lure fish, I'm taking one rod, one reel, one little bag, and I'm searching for the fish, and I'll walk a couple of miles along the beach looking and try in different spots. I'll go to my best spot, my favourite spot first, where I've caught, where I catch the fish. And if they, if there's something not right or it's not happening, then I'll I'll move to some different ground, and I'll try there somewhere that's a bit deeper and darker. So I, I'm sort of searching. I'm sometimes I might even give up on a spot completely because I've got my calculations wrong, and I'll hop back in the car and I'll drive a few miles to another spot. You know, if it's not doing it somewhere, I'm going to try try somewhere else. Especially if you know you make the effort to sort of go down there. Um, sometimes I fish a certain period of the time, tide, and then I'll go back to the car. I'll go to the calf. I'll have a um, I'll have cooked breakfast. I'll have a cup of coffee, and then I'll drive back in a few hours' time. And then I'll fish the top half of the incoming tide. So I sort of this this like you don't you don't want to exhaust yourself, you know you want to sort of um, you know you want to sort of yeah it's like you don't want to just stand there. Come on, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? You're expecting these fish to turn up on certain certain times of the tide to do with where their food is. When their food arrives, that's when they're going to be there. So it's pretty it's pretty straightforward really. Um, so. Yeah, I don't know what else I can sort of say about the lures, really. Personally, um, with the lures, if the fish are there, right, a £10.99 lure is going to catch them as much as your £25.99. However, it's nice to have them. Don't get me wrong. It's nice to have them. If the fish are there, they'll grab a £2.50 metal, oh, probably more over... The twenty five ninety nine lure. So just word of warning: if you're starting out, don't go berserk with rods and reels from the onset. If you're new to it, I would get what I would call a better than average reel right from the onset. If not a top end reel right from the onset, and I'd go for a top end rod right from the onset, and I'd buy top end braid right from the onset because you can just you know, you're, 
you know, obviously you've got to be keen enough to commit to that that sort of gear. Um, but for me, the 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 bottom of the range stuff. I mean, you know, it's like it's more suited just to fishing off a pier, just having a little go on a Sunday afternoon. You know, while you're on holiday. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like you're either going to sort of, you know, you're either going to get some gear where you can sort of probably. So yeah, I suppose you you may if you're new to it, you're going to make a few you know um, learning curves with sort of upgrading your gear as you go. I mean, I sort of um, I fish a major craft. Well, I can't remember the, the code of it now. Um, a couple hundred quid, and the reel is like it's not a great reel, but it's like a better than average sort of reel. And the braid is probably the most expensive braid you can buy. The reason why I buy the expensive braid is because wind knots are an issue with this kind of fishing, and with the expensive braid, it's very sort of it's a PE 0.2.8 or something like that, and it's woven. It's got like this like. Um, like a like a plastic coating over the actual braid, and it sort of stops it from wind knot. I've not, not had a wind knot with it yet. Um, with cheaper braids, you cast it, and that just it's all got it's crap. You spend more time just like untangling, wasting your fishing time. You might as well be if it's if you if you if you can't afford that braid. I'll be honest with you, you'd be better off um, fishing metals with um, with monofilament, like ten pound monofilament because you won't get any wind knots with it, and you can keep fishing. The most important thing about this lure fishing is that you can keep fishing f through the um, the fish time. Do you know what I'm saying? The bite time. If you're on the beach sorting out um, tangles, breakages, snap-offs, when the fish are there, then, you know what I'm saying, that's worst case scenario. You've got to be in a sort of a rhythm, cast and retrieving, cast and retrieving, over bite time and bite time I'm not being funny most of the time bite time is about 10 minutes on some tides the fish are there and then they're gone or you know they're not just there all the time they're just going through with the tide and they move off so that's why move that's why roving is good that's why moving around is good if you've had a fish and you haven't had nothing in the spot on the same casts maybe um, another thing You'll see it on my, on, my, on my videos. I'm probably repeating a little bit of what I say on the, on the videos, but I usually, it just depends where I, where I am, but I'm usually sort of casting um, a bit like hands of a clock, really. I cast with like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, and that's about it, really. And then I, then I move 10 yards. If I've not had anything after I've done that once, or twice and, and covered my angles alongside the beach as well. Most fish come, I'm just trying to think how I can explain it. Most fish seem to take the metal lure at about 11 o'clock when the lure is going against the tide. When the lure is getting much more action when the tide running against, running against the lure, if I've explained that properly. So that's that's the angle. So I'm casting that angle. Maybe I have two or three casts in that quadrant, and then I'm moving down the beach maybe ten yards, and I'm doing it again. Okay, just searching for the fish, waiting for the fish to engage. So instead of me just staying there, casting in the same spot, waiting for the fish to come along in the tide to me, I'm casting a few times, and then I'm moving down and again. So I'm moving. The fish is moving towards me, and I'm moving towards the fish. Do you know what I'm saying? So there's just a few a few sort of point is there obviously if you're if you're on a beach and you surf cast and the conditions are too extreme then i'd say don't it's not worth it don't 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 worry about it if it's like if it's just too, too difficult to fish um it's got to be enjoyable you've got to be able to relax and get a rhythm that's another thing i would say about lure fishing it's all about getting in a rhythm it's like a relaxed retrieve it's just casting in a you know being in a rhythm being in a pattern and being relaxed Right up until the fish sort of takes it. And sometimes if you're popper fishing, you'll get a, um, a big splash. Um, you get like what I call a follow. You'll have a popper on working on the surface and also you'll get a big splash like this. And you'll think, what the fuck hell is that? And there's a bass messing around with it. And that's your, your brain soon sort of engages and realizes what's, what's going on. And it might happen again. It might actually grab the lure. It doesn't hook up for somebody. You think, how the hell? Look? He's just sort of... Um, sometimes, if you're just a real slow retrieve with a popper, you'll even get a bass come up and sort of inspect it, and he'll sort of look at the little mackerel, the little fake mackerel, the little popper mackerel. He sort of inspect it and then swim off again when they're sort of, you know, they're, they're sort of inquisitive. They're like, oh, you know, 
But another time, another time it's just bang. You know, most most of the time they don't. You know, uh, you know when 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 they're a bit finicky, you they you can see the habits when they're a bit finicky versus the times when they're likely in a shoal and competing with each other, where they're just gonna they're just gonna crash into it. Do you know what I'm saying? And um, and like you say, it's like it's nice to they're good eating fish. It's nice to take one home. Um, you know, they've got to be in size. You know, it's nice to let them go. The bigger ones, um, the bigger female ones, you know, you really want to let go, really, to fight another day. Um, but you're legally allowed to, um, up to, up to 42. And, um, but yeah, it's nice to, it's nice to get your quota. It's nice to get a couple in the bag and it's nice to catch another two or three and just watch them swim off. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm never, I've never taken more than my quota because I just, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. They're beautiful, they're beautiful fish and, you know, they deserve to, to go back and do their thing, you know. So that's pretty much lure fishing. Um, another thing, knots for lure fishing, I'll quickly go into, what's the time? I don't want to take too long. Christ, it's 21 minutes already. So, you can get snippets of information out of this, out of this um, program anyway. Um, so with regards to the knot, uh, so on, let's just say a popper lure or a metal, I have a split ring, right? And I'll attach a, a good quality small swivel, put it to like 42 pound or something like that, real tiny swivel inside of it. So I've got the swivel and that. So with the swivel, it, it's gonna prevent your line twisting. Now, sometimes I have put on a bit of short fluorocarbon, but more often than not, I now just tie the braid straight to that little swivel. And what I do, I go through the eye, I go back around once, twice, three, four, five, and I pull, pull out the loop, I go back through, through the hole, Back through that that way and then round again. So I basically basically I do I think it's called um, call it a blood knot. But I almost call it like a double blood knot, blood knot. I sort of go through again, and I find you'll probably see. I think I've got it on one of my videos, and I talk about it there because I've got nothing to show you with now. Um, and basically, it's basically you can go through once with mono, no problem. It won't slip. Very rarely, very, very slip. But with braid, sometimes if the wire on your swivel is quite wide, sometimes that can just keep sliding. You know, so to prevent that or to leave a very long bit of mono, bit of braid, I, um, I'm just trying to think what, what the hell I was going to say now. Um, in case some fireworks going off, and that's just, just distracting me. So yeah, so basically, the reason why I go through twice is just to stop it sort of um, sliding, pretty much, and that never slides with that knot. I wish I could just have a bit of um, a bit of monofilament with me now. I'll just show you what I mean. But I haven't really got anything. But that's on that's on one of the knot videos, I believe. So that's pretty much it. So watch your knot slippage. Remember, these bass, a lot of the bass are like two, three, four pound. So they're not, it's not like a, a North Sea tummy heading out to sea. Do you know what I'm saying? So really, you're hooking up. It's just holding the initial sort of fight or struggle, whatever you what we call it. And then literally all you're doing, you're just coaching it in. You know, you ain't got to bully it in. Just got to hold it. I mean... If the fish has got the, the trebles in his mouth, he's sort of keeping it out of the snags. So if he's hooked up, you generally eat the, he the swim into a snag. It's not hardly ever happened to me, and it's never happened to me. So the only way you can lose it, lose the fish, is by snapping the line, and he swims off with the lure in his mouth. That's the only only way, and that that will come that if you try and hurry it too much, try and bully it too much, and the surf is quite surgy and it's let's say the fish is four or five pound and you're fishing like 10 pound braid and you're like oh you know, you, you know i'm gonna i'm gonna hook you up i'm gonna you know i'm forcing you up well the surge of on in, in a biggish sort of swell will just suck the fish out and then put it to snap your line so that's the only way 
that's the only the hook the, the, the hooks on those lures he won't be able to shake the hook very rarely this fish doesn't jump out the water and try and spit the hooks like a, a tailor would in Australia or a carway would in New Zealand where they jump out the water and they try to spit the hooks you know the bass these these hooks you know when you try and unhook the fish are very difficult to get out of the moment so these fish are hooked up the only way you're going to lose that fish is at the surf if you panic at the surf and just you know trying to hoik it up when the surf is sucking the fish back out so if that happens let the fish go he's hooked up he's not going anywhere just stay in contact with the fish wait for another wave right bring the fish up okay and then put a little bit of effort on the line to try and beach him get behind the fish right you either just put your fingers in his mouth and pull him up or grab him by the tail or just literally some some anglers lure fish and they, they have like a glove like a gardener's glove if it's cold or whatever the grip on a gardener's plastic on a on a, um, a rubber gardener's glove brilliant for picking up fish it's just like he's not going anywhere so you know if you you know if you want a bit of extra sort of grip that would be my recommendation. Just grab hold of him. You've got him. You pick him up like this and with a glove like that. But more often than not, if you've been fishing for years like me, you just pick it up any, any way you can. You might drop him and then quickly look around at the wave as it's coming in, but just, just scoop it up. Do you know what I'm saying? Another thing I'd be mindful of is your fishing tackle, especially if it's good fishing tackle. When you're finished, just give it a little rinse. When you're on the beach... Right, and you're unhooking fish and your rod is laying on the ground, be mindful of where you're treading. Don't tread on the rod because you can damage a ring or even snap the rod. Right? Other people walking their dogs. If you're fishing at the weekend, other people just walking along the beach. Be very mindful. If you can see somebody, if you've got a fish on the floor and you're trying to unhook it and your rod's laying there and you can see people walking towards you, just say to them, say, excuse me, um, I've got a rod on the floor here. Can you mind just being aware of it? You know, it's like, you might think these are sort of, but I've had people nearly damage my gear and all sorts because they want to see what's going on and they don't see the rod and they'll snap, your, they'll snap your bloody rod, mate. You know, so it's like, you know, you ain't got to be out of order about it. You just politely say to them, you know, or well, if you can see them walking towards you, stop unhooking the fish and pick the rod up and just rest it over your shoulder like that and then just grab your pliers Put them on the trebles. That's another that's another tip for unhooking the fish. Have a small set of pliers. Sometimes the bass mouths and around the gills are very sharp. That's quicker and easier just to get a, um, a small pair of pliers, fishing pliers, very lightweight ones. Grip onto the treble and just shake it like that. Shake the fish off. If it's only two, three, four pounds, just shake it off like that. Get the hooks out as quickly as possible. Release the fish and away you go. And that's, that's, that's pretty much it. I never use a net for landing fish off a beach. Some people do fishing around the Isle of Wight and stuff for fishing off the rocks and things like that where you sort of need a net because you've only got a set break and strain line. So that's pretty much it. I mean, I've, I've rambled on now it's a lot longer than I would have liked to. I like to sort of condense these videos into about sort of 10 minutes because I think people can get a bit too bored, but there's lots of details in this fishing. There'll be people who've been fishing for years and say, yeah, yeah, I know all that, I know all that. But there'll be little things what maybe they might not have picked up. Do you know what I'm saying? But um, another thing about lure fishing, you can fish at night for them. Something I've not done much of. I've generally done more um, live sand eel fishing at night with a, like a live bait on the bottom. But there's some people in the UK who um, sort of specialise in, in going at night. I personally sort of think, well, I wait about this. I like to fish during the day because I can see what I'm doing. It's a lot harder at night. It's a lot less fun at night, if you think about it. Lure fishing especially. We don't know where you're casting. They fish like these white pencil poppers on the surface, splashing around. And on a certain time of the tide, the bass, they're feeding. They don't care. They don't care. Especially if there's a bit of light from the moon or something like that. They can see it as clear as day and they'll whack into it. I'm, I'm like, well, yeah, that's that's all right if you've only got a set period of time to fish and you or you just want to give it a go at night. But I'm like, wouldn't you want to be doing that during the day? Do you know what I'm saying? Where you can really sort of see what's going on and, you know, you can sort of, you know, this, that and the other. That's just, a, it's just basically, it's just another way 
I've targeted them. That's the beauty of this bass fishing is that there's lots of different ways you can target them. Um, and obviously, with lure, the lure fishing setup, you probably want to go, are you 17 pound braid? Which is thin as anything. I was going to say you want to go as finesse and as light as possible. Um, and um, just bear that in mind when you sort of, you know, you've got one on, you just set the drag right so it can go a bit, you know. But um, that's pretty much it. That's pretty much the lures. Um, I go to, I order my gear through Veal's mail order. Um, Glasgow Angling Centre. Angling Direct. I sometimes walk into Angling Direct. They have a nice selection of Savage Gear lures. Quite really... Those Savage Gear lures are brilliant and they're good value. They're like five quid. And they, they'll... They're as good as those more top of the range lures. I don't care what anyone says. They cast a long way as well. So, you know, don't chuck all your money while on expense. It's nice to have one or two expensive ones and I would recommend probably the Pachenkyo. But an alternative lure to the Pachenkyo is the Cedra Spitter 125. It's exactly the same lure, half the price. That's 12 quid. And that's from Bill's mail order. I've had some fantastic bass crash into that lure. Um, and, um, yeah, that's pretty much, pretty much it, really. Um, I have actually got some lures over the back there I could show you, but, um, yeah, I'll just go get them. I'll just quickly go get them before I sort of hang up. What we got? So, 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 not probably all bored and left by now. Right, that is a, uh, that's one of my metals I use. I bought that from New Zealand. That's a salmon lure. That's 21 grams. And um, the, mod, the, the European equivalent is the dam, I think it's, FZ, um, same weight, 21, 22 gram. They do a lot of gold one of it, brass, and a, mainly for pike. But it's exactly the same pattern as that. And I found these are brilliant for salmon, Chinook salmon, and bass. Love it. Absolutely love it. They crash into that. And this has got a really nice vibratey sort of action. It's a beautiful lure. That's a real good get mackerel on it as well. Um, what else have I got? Now, this lure... This lure here is the Savage Gear 30 gram, and I'll be honest with you, that's my favourite. That uh, imitates a sand eel. Like I say, you can retrieve it, and it's got like this really sort of lovely, sort of wiggly action. And when you stop retrieving, it flutters down at the back to the back to the seabed. So if you're retrieving it, so you can pause it, retrieve, pause it. I've had them take it on the drop, and it does actually say that as part of the um, on the um, on the packet on how to use the lure. It mentions about it will have this reverse diving action, and I've I've had I've had them on that. Um, what else have we got? This is the Cedra Spitter One Two Five. You can see that very well. That's the Cedra Spitter One Two Five. And I think you might even be able to see some bass teeth on the on the back end of it there, maybe. That's 12, 12 quid lure, and that is when I've got that on and on popper fishing, I'm so confident. It makes me feel so confident using that. This is the other one. This is the more expensive Pachenkyo one two five in mackerel, and I'll be brutally honest with you, that's no different than the Cedar Spitter at all. I've had them on this. I've had them on that. And this is double the price. Um, so I generally don't really lose it. These, these lures have got a nice, um, very um, detailed um, sort of, what's the action? They sort of zigzag like this. They sort of zigzag. And you have to sort of, with the rod tip of the rod, you have to sort of do this with the rod tip very gently. Which is unusual, something I've had to learn. And that basically the lure has a really nice on the, really beautiful action on the surface. And bass, when they're there, they just find it irresistible. And also that action 
on a bass with a more crude pop allure, if the bass is sort of sitting on the fence whether he's hungry or not or whatever, he's being a bit finicky, I find these Pachenkio, this sort of action of lure, will entice the take versus, um, you know, a more traditional, like an old chub bug or something, something like that, you know. This is something I used when I first went to Australia, because this is pretty much what they sort of had. This was a Yozuri, uh, 90 millimeter, about 25 gram this one, 24, 25 gram. And I fished these in um, Exmouth in, um, in Western Australia. A giant Trevelli on these, Queenfish, Taylor and all sorts. These have got um, a really nice, really big dish on them. And they spit the water beautifully. And they're small. And bass love them. Bass love them. So I, I sometimes try that. I've got a video with this lure. Not this particular lure, but one identical to it. Um, where we had a bass. I think it was a year and a half ago, two years ago, something like that. I was just fishing monofilament at the time. And um, so and I've got this lure called the Zonk which I'm reluctant to use at low tide because of those three travels on there and I've only just brought it so I'm going to only use that at high tide I think and it's got some little holes in it for some to bubble up and it this has got a really good action this is a 25 quid lure I mean I'm not one for but this one's got a bit of a reputation it's got a nice rattle as well it's got a nice it's got a nice rattle that's the same with these, these Pachengios, or well, this is a Cedra, and I think it all it all adds to it. Doesn't do it any harm. Doesn't do it any harm. This is a real worn out. I've had a, I've had quite a few fish on this. This is the um, the Savage Gear, Savage Gear, and I actually prefer to use the lure, which has got all banged and chipped. I find that. Gives me more confidence as well than versus a new one. But unless the water's really mucky, I might want one with the full paint on. Um, and that's pretty much it. Single hooks. Single hooks. No bass on that. That's a trout though. Bright luminous pink. When the water's mucky, I've had them on that. C1 trout fly, you fish ahead, of, fish ahead of something like this on a teaser. Mackerel could grab that as well. You've probably got as good a chance of getting a bass on that as you have this. He's got a choice of two. Bass seem to go for the smaller one. When it's the bigger lure and the small teaser, they seem to go for the smaller lure for some reason, like it's some sort of a game. It's bizarre. Um, swivels, split rings. I'm fishing over rough ground. I'll take those trebles off if I'm fishing sort of close to the bottom, and I'll put a, I'll put a, sh a sharp single on it like that. And um, I find I find I find that good in the rough ground. If you do get hooked up, you more than often get your gear back with a single. That was with a treble. You know, it's a lot harder to get out. It's as simple as that. But there you go. Right, I think you've heard enough of me now, running on. I'm surprised that anyone's actually even listened to some of this. But I've covered all topics, I think. I've covered all avenues. Another thing with the reel, when you're loading the reel with braid... I would I would leave it down a, 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 a little bit. I would I, I wouldn't fill it right. To, I wouldn't put a load of backing on and have it sort of you know tight to the you know, the top of the spool, so to speak. I would try and have it almost like whatever it comes out, whatever whatever you've got in your um, let's just say you've got one hundred and thirty meters, one hundred and fifty meters. Just tie that straight to the bare spool and just wind it on. And the reason why I say that is because when you cast, 
there's an extra bit of slight drag there and it just prevents um, it sort of coming out of the reel too quickly and sometimes tangling. doesn't happen so much with top end braid. I use 131 Surfix braid. doesn't happen too much. But my experience is, it don't, same with the multiplier, don't fill the spool so much. Leave it down a bit. And that prevents the, the line um, spooling off and tangling and going into these sort of, you know, causing problems like that. But it really is a, a learning process. You sort of, you, you sort of, you know, you get caught on different things and you just, you think, well, what can I do with, you know. And there's a nice little tackle box. And I literally go down the beach with that. That's all I do. I put that in a little bag, a tiny little bag. Um, and I put a can of Coke in the bag, maybe a sandwich, um, reels in there, um, and maybe a little bag to put a fish in or something, and maybe a, a little fillet knife if I want to gut it or, or um, scale the fish. And, um, and that's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. Right, I'm going to have to call it because that's getting a bit long. But um, if you've got any questions about anything, if I've missed anything, which I may have done, um, and if someone sends me an email and says, oh, you missed off this, I'll be absolutely kicking myself because I think I've absolutely covered it. But there's, there's, uh, you, you don't know everything. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm always learning. Never cease to amaze me. And it's like some of these the other anglers around the country who are doing these videos, they say the same thing on their videos. Is the, the fish never ceases to surprise them. How sort of what, what they get up to and all sorts. But there you go. All right, hope you enjoyed the video, guys. Please subscribe, and um, I will see you later. Good night.